So thank you all for sticking around, uh, and thanks Joe for the introduction. Um, I must say you've somewhat stolen my thunder with my first slide. Uh, I was going to tell you a little bit about how I grew up in Northern Ireland and came to Edinburgh and then moved to Jilks and then started a PhD, but you've already heard all that, so I will immediately skip on. Um, so yeah, I am back here now in Edinburgh and uh, I work within the Policy and Innovation Group, which is led by Henry Jeffrey and there's a lot of people involved in the Policy and Innovation Group, um, but I work directly with uh, Laura Finley, David Bold and Adrian Andres. Um, since I've got here at the very end, so I started on the 29th of February, what I've been doing is I've been working uh, mostly on the Upper Project um, and a little bit on a couple of Wave Energy Scotland projects, but the Policy and Innovation Group um, pretty much they look at the gaps and barriers that prevent uh, marine renewable energy development and they kind of work at it in a couple of ways but the way in which I have been mostly working on it is uh, from a technical point of view so um, I've been working with Adrian a lot on the technical economic assessment of wave energy converters and the socio-economic assessment of wave energy converters and the life cycle uh, analysis of wave energy converters so that's kind of what I've been working on up until now um, like I said, I've only been here since the very end of February, so I can't tell you an awful lot about my work and with the pigs at the minute. Um, but they're a great bunch of lads and lasses. So. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is a little bit of work from my PhD. Um, and this is where I have to confess that uh, the bulk of this presentation was taken from a presentation I gave a couple of weeks ago um, at OMEI. So if you want to know any more about this work, uh, there is a paper that you can look up, um, and yeah, the paper was just called Oscillating Wave Surge Converter Forced Oscillation Tests. I, I just added the exciting waves bit because I think it's exciting and waves are involved. Um, so this paper uh, I co-wrote I co with uh, Dr. Jos van der Hoff, Dr. Matt Foley and Dr. Bjorn Elsesar. Um, so just to give you an overview of how the presentation is going to go, I'll give you a little bit of a background as to why I actually performed this set of experiments. Um, I'll give you a little bit of the background of the forced oscillation tests, talk a little bit about the experiments and the setup. I'll talk a bit about how I uh, process the data that I got from my experiments and then I'll just present some results mm -hmm. and uh, present what I've called the remainder torque and present some of its characteristics. So my PhD, um, officially under the supervision of Professor Trevor Whitaker and Dr. Bjorn Elsassar, but also under the unofficial supervision of Dr. Matt Foley and Dr. Jos van der Hoff, um, focused on developing the understanding of oscillating wave surge converter hydrodynamics through the physical testing of terms within the equation. Now, I did this uh, with the intention of improving how the hydrodynamics are represented within the time domain numerical model of the device, um, and this the time domain numerical model of the device is commonly used to estimate loading and power. So I've got two equations here. Um, I've got a linear frequency domain equation of motion and a weakly nonlinear time domain equation of motion. Uh, don't be alarmed if you're not familiar with these equations. The second equation doesn't appear again in the presentation, and the first one only rears its head once more. So don't freak out too much. Um, but I just want to talk about them, dwell on them here for a little minute or two, just so as I can kind of give you a bit of a background as to why I did what I did. Um, so I've highlighted here um, in, in different colours the hydrodynamic, linear hydrodynamic coefficients that are contained within these equations. So these linear hydrodynamic coefficients uh, I obtained from boundary element method codes, uh, WAMA and NEMO. So the, the torque uh, in red here is the excitation torque, so if you notice it's actually frequency dependent. Uh, it's frequency dependent because the excitation torque coefficient, its amplitude and its phase depends on the period of the waves that are entering into the system to excite it. So this, this torque here is the product of the, the excitation torque coefficient multiplied by the surface elevation. Now these green terms here uh, this is the added inertia and this is the radiation damping and they are also the magnitude of those is also frequency dependent and when they're multiplied by the respective associated motions so the acceleration and the velocity they result in two torques that when summed together 
uh, result in an overall torque that is equal to the overall linear hydrodynamic torque that acts to influence the motion of the device when it moves through a fluid. So that's the torque that the device feels whenever it would move through an otherwise still fluid. Um, and then this, this little blue coefficient here is uh, it's the hydrostatic uh, storing torque coefficient. So it's, it's akin to uh, the spring stiffness coefficient in a spring mass damper system. So uh, for my convenience and for your convenience, I have highlighted, I have color coded this. So uh, the red uh, term in this equation correlates to the red term in this equation and the green to the green here and the blue to the blue here. And again, don't worry about these integrals here. These are just convolution integrals, and they are there uh, to represent the frequency dependence of these terms in the time domain equation of motion. So they look scary. Uh, at least I thought they looked scary, but they're friendly when you get to know them, so don't worry about them too much. Uh, so what I want to talk a little bit about is um, this time domain equation of motion allows for the inclusion of uh, nonlinear terms um, this linear frequency domain one doesn't, so the time domain equation does, and that's why you kind of run this equation in the time time domain. Um, now, the number of nonlinear torques that you have in your equation will depend on your device, and it will depend on how much you want to confuse early stage PhD students. Um, I here only have uh, one nonlinear torque that I want to focus on, and that is the nonlinear torque that's associated with the hydrodynamics. Now this torque, um, it needs to be included and it has to exist here um, because of the inability of the linear hydrodynamic coefficients that I obtained from my band codes, for, for the inability that they have um, to represent how the waves and fluid influence the behaviour of the device when things start getting large. So whenever the, the surface elevation gets large, whenever the amplitudes of motion get large, because these here are calculated uh, with calculations that are based on linear approximations, whenever you violate those linear approximations, then they don't do as good a job. So you need to include a nonlinear term to make it work, really. So that th this, this nonlinear term is often um, modelled as the drag torque component of the Morrison's equation. Um, so it makes sense, um, but it is often just thrown in there to make the thing work. So, like I said, it's a drag torque equation, uh, or drag torque coefficient, sorry. So we know that the, the velocity within that is a velocity squared, um, and then you multiply it by a drag coefficient. But what is, I guess my question is, what is the drag coefficient? Um, now, I have scarred the literature, and there's not, not an awful lot of uh, drag coefficients uh, for this scenario. So what you would normally do, or what you'd conventionally do, is you would perform a lot of tank tests in order to calibrate this term. So you would say, look, well, we, you know, we have to perform a lot of experiments to get a good uh, drag torque coefficient that we can use to make this numerical model work. Now, that's great, but uh, experimental testing is expensive, both in terms of time and money. So you kind of want to avoid that. So with, with my PhD, what I was doing was I was looking at this equation and I was saying, look, this is pretty, this is pretty good. Um, we can get uh, hydrodynamic coefficients from established codes and they will drop right in and that's brilliant. Um, but this nonlinear component, there must be a better way of, there must be a better way of attaining this and learning more about it and characterizing it. So uh, what I did is I performed a set of experiments uh, focusing, on, focusing in on each of these hydrodynamic coefficients and I wanted to test to see when these hydrodynamic coefficients, when they broke, you know, so I, I was kind of pushing my, my experiments. I started off uh, within sort of a linear regime and I evaluated how the measured data compared with the BEM code estimates. And then I kind of pushed it a bit further and I wanted to see how they broke. So uh, for, for example, um, with the wave excitation torque, uh, I performed tests in which I looked to see how the wave excitation torque varied with wave period with wave amplitude and with device position. So the tests that I'm going to talk to you about today were similar tests performed to evaluate uh, these hydrodynamic coefficients. So that's the added inertia and radiation damping. So that's just about enough of that slide. Um, so just a bit of a background on the oscillating wave surge converters. So oscillating wave surge converters um, are large flat type wave energy converters that couple with the surge uh, water particle motion uh, in the wave 
and the the model that I tested with was most similar to Aquamarine Power's Oyster device. So Oyster was a surface piercing bottom hinged oscillating wave surge converter that was uh, deployed in the near shore region of the, de the design space where it coupled with the amplified surge motion of the water particles in that region. So this is what my this is what my test set was kind of like. It was kind of like this big device, but a lot smaller. So uh, forced oscillation tests um, are by no means uh, a new concept. Um, I they, they they are they are an experimental means of determining this added inertia and this radiation damping coefficients that I was talking about in the equation for yeah. So it's an experimental means of obtaining these. And what you do is you measure the motion of the device. So I measured the motion of the OWSC and then I measured the torque required to cause that motion. And through calculation, I was able to obtain the added inertia and radiation damping coefficients. Um, now, like I say, it's not a new technique. The oldest uh, study in my lit review for this sort of work is from, 19, from 1874. And it's not a new concept here in Edinburgh at all. Um, within the paper that uh, this presentation is associated with. There are four references for work that's been done in Edinburgh on forced oscillation tests. So there's the work of David Skiner on the duck, there's C.P. Lynn and Greg Payne's work on the IPS boy, and then even up until recently Cameron did work uh, with an OWSC and another device in the curve tank. So forced oscillation tests, they're, they're not new, um, and it's a well-established method. Um, so just uh, quickly, just to look at the uh, actual characteristics of the linear hydrodynamic torque. Um, on the top here uh, is the characteristics of the hydrodynamic torque itself. So on this top left plot, I have the amplitude of the hydrodynamic torque. And along the bottom, I have the forced oscillation period. So this is the, the period with which um, I, f you know, I forced the, device, the OWSC to oscillate. So that's the amplitude of the hydrodynamic torque, and this is the phase of the hydrodynamic torque. So a phase of zero radians would indicate that the hydrodynamic torque acted in phase with velocity. A phase of pi over two would indicate that the hydrodynamic torque acted in phase with the acceleration. So this is the characteristics of the actual hydrodynamic torque. Um, and like I was saying earlier, this overall hydrodynamic torque is the summation of the torque, which the inertial torque and the radiation torque. So just to see how these correspond to the added inertia and radiation damping uh, curves. So uh, this is the added inertia curve, and you see how this changes over the period range, and it's the radiation damping curve, and you see how it changes over the period range. Um, so these are the curves that I will be comparing my data to. And I, so what I will point out is in my tests, I compared um, my experimental data to numerical estimates made by WAMIT, which is this you know, established uh, demo code that you've probably all heard of, and NEMO, which is a sort of recently re released open source code. Um, I've, yeah, all my, all my plots have WAMA and NEMO data in there. I'm not going to nail my colors to the mast and say which one I think is better. I will leave that up to you to decide, um, but one is free and the other is not. Um, so with the forced oscillation tests, uh, I performed the forced oscillation test in Queen's University Belfast's uh, port ferry wave basin. So the port ferry wave basin is 18 metres uh, by 16 metres in size, and it has uh, absorbing features on all of the edges, so they were good for absorbing the radiated waves that were generated from my device. So you can see, this is, this is my device actually in here, and the radiated waves are, you know, they are radiating from the device. Um, and the absorbing, uh, the absorbing beaches that I have around, you know, they kind of lessen the influence of the reflected waves. So I performed two sets of tests during my forced oscillation tests. Uh, I performed tests in which I maintained a constant angular displacement over uh, a range of 11 periods. So with those tests, I had four different constant angular displacements, and I maintained those over the 11 periods. So what would happen is as period increased and you maintained the same constant angular displacement, then your velocity would reduce. And then the other set of tests I performed, I maintained a constant angular velocity over the same 11 periods. So with these tests, the, uh, as the period increased, then the angular displacement increased. Um, so yeah, I'll touch on that again, but that's, that's essentially, those are the two types of tests that I performed. Um, and this is the setup that I used. Uh, this is the force feedback dynamometer. It's an active force feedback dynamometer. So 
Because it's active, it means that I can drive it and I can measure the motion and I can also measure the force required to cause that motion. So to measure rotation, I had a hinge-mounted accelerometer, which was acted like an inclinometer. This is actually my OWSC model here. So it's 650 mil wide by 24 mil thick, and it was uh, 310 mil from the hinge to the top edge. So uh, when I when I actually filled when I filled the water up, this is quite low here because I was doing some tests in the bearings. But whenever I filled the water up, um, the hinge depth was about 230 mil. So uh, I have a torque transducer located in the hinge here, and that measured the torque that was required to drive the flap. Uh, up here I have a permanent magnet synchronous motor, uh, which is connected to this bottom assembly via a timing belt. And timing belts are trouble, uh, so maybe leave them out of any experiments you need to do. Um, so the permanent magnet synchronous, synchronous motor uh, was controlled by a PLC, which is out of shot, and it was run in control, uh, position control. So just a quick note on uh, processing of the forced oscillation test data. So the torque that I measured with my torque tube, it wasn't purely um, hydrodynamic torque. It was actually hydrodynamic torque plus a bunch of other torques. So these other torques are torques due to the, the hydrostatics of the system. So that's the trade-off between the torque due to buoyancy and the torque due to the weight of the device. And then there's a torque due to the inertia of the axle body itself. And then there's also a bearing torque, a bearing friction torque. Now, I, what I did is I performed tests to measure each of these additional torques, and I'm going to say straight away that the bearing torque uh, was insignificant relative to other things in the system, so I'm just going to immediately forget about that. Um, but uh, I measured the uh, inertial torque uh, by performing 3 decay tests with my flat in the dry, and then I also you know, confirmed that by looking at a SOLIDWORKS model uh, and getting the properties from that. Um, and then I obtained the hydrostatic uh, torque uh, by looking at, uh, well, I performed a test where I you know, fixed the device and measured the hydrostatic torque, and then that validated um, analytical calculations too. So pretty much what I do is I have my measured torque, and then I subtract the torque uh, due to buoyancy, due to weight, and due to the inertia. And then whenever I subtract those from the measured torque, I end up with the hydrodynamic torque. So just on to the results. Uh, so these are the results from the uh, constant angular displacement forced oscillation tests. So uh, on the left here, I have my added inertia, and on the right, I have my radiation damping. Now, I will point out, um, when I presented this at the conference, I did get pinged for calling this a radiation damping plot. Uh, in this plot is a radiation damping curve obtained from the bend codes, but what I've actually plotted on here is the coefficients of the torque that is in phase with the velocity. So it's actually, it is actually radiation damping plus something. Um, but anyway, that, that, will, that will matter more whenever I show you the next slide. Um, but anyway, so for the constant angular displacement tests, the agreement is pretty good. So if you bear in mind, uh, this is where the fastest velocities are because it's the constant amplitude and the shortest periods, and then this is where the lowest velocities are. And well, I guess what you could say is so the agreement is good. If you the, the larger the amplitude of motion, um, the greater the mismatch. Um, but in general, these results are pretty good. I'm pretty happy with them. Now, if I go on to the uh, constant angular velocity uh, tests, the, agree, the first thing to observe is the agreement isn't so good. Um, so what we have here is bear in mind, I'm keeping a constant angular velocity, and as period increases, then the angular displacement also increases. So uh, up here at this point here, the amplitude of motion is 30 degrees, and then here is 24 degrees, and here is 20 degrees. So you're, you, I mean, you're getting quite large amplitudes of motion. So. Um, yeah, this, uh, it is what it is. This, this, this shows a bit of a breakdown in the, uh, the estimations made by the BEM codes. Um, so the next step then is to try and figure out what is, what is, what, what, what is this additional uh, coefficient here and what, is the, what are the additional torques that are going on here. Actually, one thing I will point out is what I found kind of interesting is um, here, in this region here, in short periods with the constant angular velocity, what you'll get is quite a violent, um, you know, the thing will be pitching back and forward and it'll be quite a violent uh, water profile on the surface, but yet the agreement is 
well, I'd say it's better here than it is over here. And um, yeah, I just think that's worth pointing out. That's kind of interesting. And I guess it's because in this region here, the pool and cartons numbers are really low. So you know, you, I've seen seen plenty of studies where you'd say that if there's a low pool and cartons number, then the the torque actually goes very quickly to the linear uh, potential theory estimation of what the torque should be. So yeah, this is that is quite interesting. I think. Um, so yeah, so if I move on to try and figure out uh, what actually what else is in the system, what's going on, uh, what is the torque that is not estimated by the BEM codes? This is where I calculate my remainder torque. So what I've done here is I have my measured torque, or measured hydrodynamic torque in blue, and then I have the BEM code estimate. So what I've done is I've taken the the velocity of the WSC's oscillation and then I multiplied it by the complex uh, hydrodynamic uh, radiation torque coefficient. And then I subtracted one from the other, and then I've got another signal here. So this is the torque that is not estimated by the BEM codes. This is the remainder torque. So uh, just to talk briefly about the characteristics of that. Um, so apologies, this slide is a little bit mashed together, um, and as, as this one. But uh, what I have here is I have uh, the amplitude of uh, coefficient for the remainder torque. Uh, against period and here I have the phase of the remainder torque against period and the lines with the squares they were obtained during the constant uh, angular velocity forced oscillation tests and the lines with the stars were obtained during the um, constant angular displacement forced oscillation tests. So uh, these, these, these figures are kind of confusing to look at and if I'm being totally honest whenever I plotted remainder torque properties against other uh, parameters it was also confusing. Um, but what is what is interesting to see is uh, actually how the gradient changes uh, in the amplitude of the uh, remainder torque coefficient. So, if we look at the constant angular displacement uh, results, what you'll see is the uh, amplitude of the remainder torque coefficient increases with period uh, initially, and then it quickly, uh, it steeply, the gradient kind of drops. So. The remainder torque amplitude coefficient reduces as period increases, and that's the same for each of the constant angular displacement test, you know, scenarios. Um, they all drop at the same period, but that's probably more to do with the resolution of the frequency steps that I took. Uh, now, if you look at the uh, constant angular velocity tests, what you'll see is the slope isn't quite as steep and it gets less steep as you uh, increase the velocity so um, I guess that's kind of interesting it's, I mean what that sort of suggests that uh, yeah for that for that velocity yeah the amplitude of the coefficient is on you know it's almost the same uh, for this period range so that's interesting in a way um, and if we move on to looking at the phase of the remainder torque, I guess the take home thing from here as well is quite a well conditioned problem um, for short periods. So all the lines seem to overlap up to uh, 1.2 second oscillation period. And then after that, there's a bit of a spread. But um, if we were to use like a drag coefficient, if we were to use a velocity squared drag term, then that would act completely in phase uh, with the velocity. So sorry, I should say again that this is relative to velocity, so zero phase. For zero radians means that it's in phase with the velocity. Uh, negative radian values indicate that it's act tending to act more <coughs> in phase with the, the rotation or the angular displacement. And positive values means that it's tending to act more in phase with the acceleration. So yeah, if, if, we, if I was to use a drag squared term, then it would just be right along this line. So um, that is interesting. So uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is kind of, where I sort of got to uh, with the results of this. Now, I have, I have attempted a number of numerical methods for, uh, you know, modeling this nonlinear remainder torque. Um, I haven't really standard ch checked them with my supervisors yet, so I'm not ready to present them. Um, but if anybody wants to have a chat uh, about kind of the, thing, the ways I've approached this uh, in the numerical model, come and see me afterwards. But uh, just to tie things up, in in conclusion, I have performed forced oscillation tests to validate uh, the hydrodynamic coefficients obtained from two boundary element method codes, uh, so that's WAMA and NEMO. Um, the BEM codes, they estimated hydrodynamic torque well up to 0.3 radians, so that's about, you know, about 
20 degrees, no, 70 to 20 degrees. Um, I kind of feel like uh, oh, well, it estimates the heavy metal torque quite well up to this point, but beyond that, whenever the angular displacement increases more, then the agreement is a bit poorer. In terms of the remainder torque, um, the remainder torque amplitude, the, co the co amplitude of the coefficient increased with uh, increasing oscillation period for periods less than one second, but afterwards then it dropped off. Uh, it, de it decreased as uh, oscillation period increased, um, and that was different for both the constant angular displacement and constant angular velocity tests. And in terms of the phase of the remainder torque. Um, it lagged the WHC velocity for periods less than 1.2 seconds, and then it lagged the WHC velocity for periods greater than 1.2 seconds. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of tying this all together now into a bit of my thesis. So, uh, if you have any questions or comments, they'd be very welcome, um, and I might tie it into my thesis. So, but thank you very much for listening. <laughs>